Good morning to our audience in the United States. Good afternoon to our audience in Kiev and in other places in Europe. My name is John Herbst and I run the Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council. We have a terrific event for you this morning. We have Ambassador Masha Jovanovich, who will talk about her new book, Lessons from the Edge, in a conversation with my extraordinary partner in the Eurasia Center, Melinda Herring. But before we get to that, I want to say something. Normally, I do these introductions very quickly. It'll be a little bit less quick right now. Masha Jovanovich was one of the outstanding ambassadors of her generation in the Foreign Service. And she did everything she needed to do just the way she needed to do it as ambassador in, in Kiev from 2016 to 2019 and ran afoul of power centers in both Washington and Kiev. You need to actually be a, a novelist, have the powers of perception of a novelist to unravel what happened to Masha. Uh, but what it essentially boils down to is this extraordinary concatenation of individuals and events. If there weren't two Ukrainian, or I should say Ukrainian and Belarusian American grifters who wanted to make a fast buck in Ukraine, uh, this probably would not have happened. If you didn't have corrupt officials at very high levels, maybe even the highest levels, in Ukraine who did not like Marsh's strong stance, fully consistent with American policy, to push against corruption in Ukraine, this might not have happened. And if those two grifters did not somehow connect with the most powerful political forces in the United States, what happened would not have happened. Now, I've just said to understand this properly, perceive it properly, you need the skills of a novelist. But I'm here to tell you this morning that F. Scott Fitzgerald was wrong. He infamously said, infamously, that there are no second acts in American life. Well, we're here today because Masha, after a very tough time, and I saw that up close going to Kiev all the time during those years, is in the renaissance of her second life with this book and having a real impact on issues beyond the nastiness that was happening in Ukraine, uh, sadly made worse by the nastiness that was happening here in Washington. Melinda, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. I, I agree with that description. This is a wonderful book. If you haven't had a chance yet, it's available on Amazon. It's called Lessons from the Edge. Masha, let's jump right into it. We have about 30 minutes, uh, and we are we have an in-person audience. We welcome your questions, and we also welcome everyone's questions online. So congratulations on your wonderful book. I really Thanks. enjoyed it. I think it's witty. I think it's a joy to read. <laughs> uh, what motivated you to write it? That was one of my first questions. You say over and over again, I'm an introvert. I don't like the spotlight. So you're in the spotlight again. What's going on? In the spotlight again. So 2019 was the worst year of my life, bar none. Um, personally, professionally, it was a terrible year. And uh, really, at the conclusion of that year, all I really wanted to do was, you know, crawl into a hole and pull it in after me. Um, but after uh, my testimony um, before Congress, I got a lot of letters from uh, people in the American public who, you know, thanked me for my service. and. Um, said they wanted to hear more, that they didn't know very much about the Foreign Service, uh, what were the challenges, what were the opportunities. A lot of younger people said, you know, how do I join the Foreign Service? And so as I was thinking about, you know, what would my second act be, I uh, thought, well, maybe I'll write a book. And I did get the opportunity to write that book. And um, really, the, I thought that maybe through some of my stories and my experiences, people would better understand not only the State Department, but the importance of diplomacy to every American. Another question that baffled me, or a theme that baffles me, is the State Department doesn't stand with you in the end. But you, you, over and over again, you say, I want to tell the American people about the State Department. I've worked there for 33 years. Why do you defend, why, why do you remain loyal to an institution that wasn't loyal to you? Well, I don't think the whole institution uh, was um, disloyal to me. I mean, in fact, I feel that the way the um, senior people, starting with um, Secretary Pompeo, treated me was really a, a betrayal. Yeah. And not just of me, but of all ambassadors out there trying to do hard things in the name of our foreign policy. And uh, when I was sort of um, you know, tossed out because it was convenient to do so, um, that really, I think, raised questions all around the world among ambassadors. You know, should I be doing this? Should I be 
um, making people mad, um, you know, perhaps in, in my host country, perhaps in the United States, because uh, you're breaking somebody's rice bowl, um, even though it is U.S. foreign policy. Um, so it, it, it went far, far um, broader than just me, and it was far more damaging because it damaged our national security interests. Um, but that, that thin layer at the top, the political level, is not the whole State Department. I mean, there are thousands of people who are doing the right thing every day and doing important things mm -hmm. for the American public, and that's the State Department that, you know, that I remember and love and that I encourage people who are thinking about joining uh, to join. So you have a niece who's uh, in her early 20s. Would you recommend the Foreign Service to your niece or to other college students today, knowing what uh, you know now? Absolutely. I mean, but so I say yes, but I will qualify. Okay, it. please qualify. <laughs> so I love the Foreign Service. I, uh, you know, I love foreign policy. I love history. Mm -hmm. I love traveling. Um, I love all parts of travel, you know, the meeting different people, the different cuisines, everything else. Um, that's not a life for everybody. You know, yeah. some people don't want to move every couple of years, and you're not only moving uh, yourself and your household, you're also uh, changing jobs. That's a lot of disruption, a lot of change. Yeah. And, uh, and you may not always be, um, because we are generalists and we do different jobs in different places, you may not be always be doing the thing that you think you should be doing at that particular moment in time. So I think, you know, people need to go into it with their eyes wide open. But you sort of got lucky because you were an ambassador. You were sort of a specialist on the former Soviet Union, and you got to serve as the ambassador in Armenia, Kyrgyzstan, and Kiev. Is that unusual to spend so much time of one's career in one region? Well, I think... Um, you know, there was some luck involved, though, okay. right? <laughs> because the, the Soviet Union um, uh, fell apart sure. in uh, 1991, and at that time there was one ambassador, uh, one Russian-speaking mm -hmm. ambassador in Moscow. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, there were 15 countries. Mm -hmm. uh, so the ambassador in Moscow was still there, but everybody was looking, uh, the State Department um, uh, folks were looking for ambassadors for all these new embassies that we were setting up mm -hmm. in the new countries. And at that at that point in my career, 1991, I was still relatively junior, but um, by the time I um, you know, got to Kyrgyzstan, I was more senior, and people, people who spoke Russian, who had area yeah. expertise, were in high demand, yeah. including for the top jobs in the region. And so I was very fortunate in that respect. And I'll tell you another way, because I talk about being female in the Foreign, in mm -hmm. the foreign Service and the State Department, and how that was not always easy. Yeah. But I also caught a lucky break, because in the... Um, early 2000s, uh, the um, people were looking for women mm -hmm. that they could, you know, promote into these jobs. And so I think, you know, I was fortunate in that respect as well. That's exactly where I wanted to go. So you talk <laughs> a lot about female leadership and the mm -hmm. double standards that professional women face in the Foreign Service. Uh, I was wondering about Beth Jones. It's a name that comes up over and mm -hmm. over again. And she has a legendary reputation she at the does. State Department for promoting women. Did you guys, and I know that you're friends, do you have a formal mentorship relationship? How does that work within the State Department? You know, the interesting thing, uh, I'll answer your question sure, in a sec, sure. but the interesting thing about writing a book, at least for me, this memoir, is that um, all of a sudden I could see patterns in my life. Hmm. And one of the patterns that I saw was um, the important role that Beth played in my life, even though I hadn't really realized it. Hmm. She was far senior to me. Um, you know, I, I sort of revered her as a role model, but we didn't really interact that much except for, you know, at big conferences. And, and then even then it wasn't, you know, one-on-one -on -one or anything. Um, but, you know, she had, she had two, two really important impacts on me. Um, I really admired the way she did her job. And, um, you, you know, she was straightforward. She was no nonsense. She got the job done. Um, and she was also kind. Mm. Um, and uh, she had, um, you know, kind of a, a moral backbone where sometimes others did not. Um, and the other thing is, you know, she helped me move forward. I didn't always see that hand um, as, as one doesn't when one is junior, but she helped me move forward along the way mm -hmm. and was certainly instrumental in um, uh, getting me the nomination for uh, or the appointment to Kyrgyzstan, which was my first ambassadorship. And she has been a great friend um, ever ever since. And it was never anything formal. Okay. Um, but um, after she left um, uh, the State Department, actually, that's when we became uh, friends and sort of visited each other and so forth. And she remains a good friend today. How, how does that work now in the State Department, Ambassador? If you're a young uh, female Foreign Service officer, do you just sort of look for someone who's a couple steps up and seek them out? Or is there a more formal mentorship ladder now? Um, there is um, a formal uh, mentorship ladder now. Um, 
I'm not sure how successful they are. I've participated in, um, in, 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 in those more formal programs, and it's not just for women, it's also uh, for, for, for men who also sure. uh, need mentorship. Um, but it's, um, y you know, I think it's like anything in life. You know, you get together, you have lunch, mm -hmm. and some, some pairs uh, will click and, sure. and, and you keep on going. Um, and I have an, a number of people that I've met through that formal process who I've kept on going with. And others, you know, I mean, one lunch, another phone call, and, and that's it. Somehow, somehow what, what I had to offer was not what that person needed. And that's fine, because I actually think that the informal mentorship um, is um, probably the most, yeah. uh, the most effective. And you get it at, in all sorts of different, different ways. It's not always people who are super, super sure. senior. Sometimes it's from colleagues, um, sometimes even from people who are junior to you. Absolutely. Uh, one of my favorite sections in the book is when you're in Somalia. So mm -hmm. Ambassador Yovanovitch was in Somalia and you were in charge. Uh, but I was not ambassador. <laughs> you were not an ambassador. So this is the beginning of your career. This is my favorite part. You are the head of the motor pool and you're, uh, you're in charge of making sure that the embassy has enough fuel for generators. And you often found yourself in really tricky situations. So your staff was all male, if I get that right, mm -hmm. and the relative of a powerful leader fancied you and there was no one to help you navigate that situation and he would show up at the embassy a lot to smile and wave at you um, and then you also ended up in weird situations in Somali homes where you weren't sure if you should go prepare food with the women or if you should chat with the man the men uh, have these situations for female foreign foreign service officers changed or do women still find themselves in these very delicate situations I, I so for me, um, it changed over time as I became more senior because ambassador, as ambassador, if you're in a home in that kind of situation, there's no question that yeah. you're going to be sitting with the yeah, men sure. um, talking about um, the issues of the day. Um, although, you know, as a woman, I, I, I still always find that a little awkward because, yeah. um, you know, we, we, there are many parts of ourselves. There's the professional, but there's also our gender. And, and how can one be respectful um, in, in, in a culture that... Um, respecting our own culture but also respecting uh, the other culture I think that's that's always a tricky thing um, and I would imagine for um, for more junior officers that is that is still an issue out there one thing though um, as in as in Somalia which was a Muslim country um, you know I was kind of assigned a third gender and mm -hmm. <laughs> and my my colleagues including Beth um, who have served in the Middle East say this is very common mm -hmm. that you, you know you're you're clearly not a man but you're also not treated as a woman you're treated as somebody kind of in between and in fact um, in Somalia I was I was referred to as Mr. Mosh <laughs> Masha being my name <laughs> and uh, Mr. because you know clearly I was in charge, and so clearly I wasn't a miss or a missus. <laughs> it was um, it was kind of crazy. <laughs> wow. That and and other, um, other of my colleagues later on um, told me that the same thing had happened to them. So I think that's just a way that um, uh, men in certain societies handle the fact that there's a female boss. And that it doesn't necessarily make sense within <laughs> their, their own framework. Exactly. Uh, let, let's move forward a lot yeah. um, mm -hmm. to, to what happened to you with mm -hmm. the situation with President Trump. So I think a lot of us would like to know, uh, we remember when President Trump threatened you. Uh, when, when he, he said... the perfect phone call. You, the perfect phone call. How did you feel when you heard that? And do you feel safe now? Yeah. Well, I, 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 I mean, to cut to the chase, I do feel safe now. Um, and um, I... Um, I certainly, um, even at the time, I felt safe physically. I mean, I, I wasn't concerned about my physical security, but I wasn't sure, um, so just to refresh um, our, our audience, um, in the perfect phone call between President Zelensky and, and um, President Trump, um, when they discussed me, um, President Trump offered that she's gonna go through some things. And um, I didn't know that until I read the transcript with the rest of the world in uh, September of 2018. And I didn't know what that meant. He had already pulled me out of Ukraine. Um, he had already, you know, in my view, humiliated me completely by trashing or having others trash my reputation. And I didn't know at that point. I wasn't even sure I was employable anymore. I didn't know that people would believe me. Um, and so, you know, to hear that, uh, or, or not to hear it, but to read uh, the transcript, um, it was uh, it was devastating for me because. I wasn't sure what that meant, but I knew it was nothing good. Um, but I thought, you know, is he, uh, at that point I was thinking about retiring. Would he, uh, would forces um, take away my pension? Mm -hmm. Would there be an investigation? Because in the real world that you and I inhabit, 
in the real world, if you accuse somebody, an ambassador, of, of something, if you, um, you know, pull them out of their post, there should be an investigation, right? Sure. Um, and it, would there be an investigation? Would charges be brought? You know, all trumped up, but I, I just didn't know what it meant, and it was uh, very unsettling. For sure, for sure. How do you understand what happened to you now? So you were a uh, brilliant three-time ambassador, and that's very rare to, to serve as an ambassador for three times. You were canned from the, the Foreign Service because you spoke truth to power. It, it, is, is it an anom anomaly? Was it the t you know, just the Trump administration, or is there something more deeply broken I within our institutions? Well, um, you know, just speaking about um, the Foreign Service today and the Foreign Service at that time, um, I, I wasn't the only person that was treated, um, you know, really unfairly. Uh, and I think, um, I, obviously, my, my, my situation was very, very public. Yeah. And at the time, that was mortifying for me. Uh, but in some ways, it, it was a good thing because I was able to tell my story finally publicly, including, you know, not only uh, in the testimony, but also in, in the book, and, um, and, and sort of come to, to grips with it and come to grips with it publicly whereas others have not, um, have not um, been, been so fortunate. I, I think that the State Department and the Foreign Service specifically has to really do um, a serious rethink about, uh, you know, about what comes next. Uh, and uh, the Belfer Center at Harvard has uh, recently done a study on um, you know, what, what the Foreign Service should be thinking about mm -hmm. in terms of reform. And I think it's a really good blueprint to start with um, and to think about to, to think about the future. One of the points that this report makes is that um, after the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. uh, the military um, had to uh, rethink how, how, how they thought about war. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, and that was enshrined in legislation. And they were brought kicking and screaming to that. It was an act of Congress that made them do this. Um, after 9-11, uh, our intel agencies also had to reform. And um, perhaps we haven't had quite as uh, dramatic a crisis as those two other areas, um, but I think that we do need to look at what are the challenges of foreign policy, of our national security in, um, in this century, um, because there are all sorts of things that we weren't thinking about, you know, 40 years ago. Yeah. What are those challenges and how can we best approach them? And I think many of our, our tools and the way we do things are, are right, um, you know, because it's a relationship-based um, business, um, but there are many things that we uh, can adapt and change and um, you know, um, uh, start uh, doing as well. And so I think, I think it's time for a real, real rethink. We had a conversation about this a couple of months ago. I know that the, <laughs> the Foreign Service is having problems recruiting people. Uh, could you say more about how the Foreign Service could make uh, its recruitment, how, how it can bring more young people into the system, more yeah. qualified mid-level professionals? I have heard, though, um, that actually um, the State Department is is having um, more success in, oh, in terms of recruiting people, and I, I do hope that that's true. I think that we need to be more nimble, more flexible, yeah. because it's a very long process. So you take a um, you you take an exam, you write these essays. You know, months pass. Um, you need to get a physical, and you know, pass the physical requirements. You need to. Um, um, past security requirements. And, you know, people who want to do foreign affairs have often traveled overseas. Imagine that. And so it's harder and takes longer to, you know, make sure that uh, you are on the uh, up and up uh, overseas as well. It can take a year. It can take two years. And that's, you know, that was really hard when I joined the Foreign Service. Yeah. Now, today, yeah. people don't wait that long for the next opportunity. Something else is going to come exactly. up and they're going to grab it. And so we need to, I think, be more flexible and um, figure out how we can um, sort of streamline this process. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, is, is there anything more that you want to say about the, the, the Trump episode? No, I mean, no. I, think, <laughs> I think we've covered that. Super, okay. Well, I, another section that I really liked in your book is your, your optimism. I think it really pervades your book and it, it pervades who you are as a person. So you, you write about your optimism both in Ukrainians and in our, America's ability to renew itself. And I saw you speak, uh, I think one of the low points of COVID, you were being honored at Penn, um, and you were such a powerful voice there. And you were talking about the need to renew our institutions and your faith in the process that you hadn't given up. And I thought, Masha, you definitely are having a renaissance. It's time for you to run for, for, for Congress. I, I know that public service runs in your veins. Have, have you thought about going back into public service at any point? 
Well, I think, um, you know, I had a good run, 33 years, and I think it's probably somebody else's uh, turn right now. But never say never. I mean, if the right job comes up where I can make a difference, yeah. of course I would want to do that. That's what I've spent my career doing. Um, right now, I'm, I'm doing a lot of public speaking about the book, but it also gives me a chance to talk about Ukraine sure. and how important it is that the U.S. support Ukraine um, in this in Russia's war of choice, um, not only for Ukraine, um, but also for the United States, because this is about our national security and the international order. And so that's how I'm, I, I like to think I'm making a difference right now. Um, but if something came up uh, in another uh, way, you know, I'd have to look at it. Excellent. I'm glad to hear that. Let, let's talk about Ukraine now. So mm -hmm. uh, Russia's, Russia's war of choice, I like that phrase. Putin mm -hmm. went back into Ukraine in a big way on the 24th of February. Yeah. Uh, will Ukraine win the war and what more should the U.S. and the West be doing that we aren't doing now? Well, um, I, I thought it was a great message coming out of um, the Secretary of Defense and Secretary of St State's visit on Sunday, on Orthodox Easter, um, to, um, to, to Ukraine. It was a great message. Ukraine is going to win. I mean, I have always believed this. I know you have always believed it. Um, but we, um, uh, we need to help Ukraine win and keep on providing um, you know, humanitarian, economic, political support, but most crucially right now is the security assistance and keep on um, sending more, more, more and backfilling what we are sending. Super, super. Uh, I, I want to go, I have one last question about the, the, the awful episode. So you, you wrote a, a bit about how the, uh, the Ukrainian presidential administration knew what was going on. Mm -hmm. President Poroshenko was working with Prosecutor General Lutsenko and Lutsenko was keeping Poroshenko aware. Uh, has Poroshenko or Lutsenko, and then Zelensky also said nasty things about you in the perfect phone call. Have any of these guys ever apologized to you? No. Would you accept an apology? Well, I, I, I don't see any of the three of them actually offering me an apology. Oh. And, you know, I've moved on. Yeah. Okay, super. Uh, now it's my pleasure to bring in our audience mm -hmm. and our virtual audience and our in-person audience. Okay, this is a great question from Charles McLean. He says, Masha, in light of what happened since February 24th, mm -hmm. are there any conclusions or opinions you would revise in your book? You know, it, it <laughs> 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 I asked myself the same question. Um, you know, I wish I had been tougher, uh, tougher on um, Putin in, in the epilogue. I mean, the book isn't really about Putin, although um, because Russia and, you know, Putin's, um, Putin's rise kind of... Um, paralleled my career in, in, in the region and especially my, uh, the three ambassadorships that I had and uh, Russia obviously was the biggest uh, force um, in, in, in the region. Uh, I did talk about uh, Russia and Putin a bit. Um, I wish I had done more of that and perhaps been stronger in the, in the epilogue, but I have to say I think the epilogue holds up. Okay, super. Do I have any in-person questions? I do. Yeah, Viola, go ahead. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. They're being typed in. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, this is a great question. What is your, so on Sunday, you hinted at this. Uh, we had a big visit in Kiev, mm -hmm. and uh, it's been announced that Bridget Brink is going to be the yeah. U.S. ambassador. We're finally going to have an ambassador. Uh, what advice do you have for her? Well, I wouldn't presume to give, uh, first of all, I am thrilled that Bridget was nominated. She is going to be a fantastic ambassador. Um, she, has, she is so well qualified. She knows the region. When I was ambassador to Ukraine my first year, she was my counterpart in Washington okay. working on the policy side. I know her very well. And she, was, she is a, a, a great appointment. And I hope, that, um, I hope that the Senate moves really swiftly because we need an ambassador who is confirmed by the Senate in place. This is an obvious question, but can you explain what's the difference uh, in Kiev or in Moscow or in Yerevan, a difference between a highly qualified DCM and a Senate appoint, uh, appointed ambassador. How is it perceived differently in the capital? Well, I think it's perceived differently here in Washington, for one thing. I mean, you just have a lot more um, WASTA, right? Okay. Um, and, I mean, the, the Senate has approved you. It's, and, you know, this is something that is in our Constitution, um, so it's important. And then, um, you know, many capitals are very protocol conscious. Okay. And so I'm not saying this is the case in, in Ukraine, but um, many, um, many um, leaders won't see um, people that aren't actually the ambassador. It's hard enough for the ambassador to get in. 
um, others might have an even uh, even tougher time. So I think I think it's important to have a fully staffed embassy, um, you know, headed by a, a, a Senate confirmed uh, ambassador in a place like Ukraine. Well, everywhere, but especially in especially a place in like Ukraine. Ukraine. Yeah, yeah. And during a war. Yeah. Your friend Stephen Fisher says thank you, Masha, for yeah. everything you did and are still doing since the Trump administration's. Uh, scandalous action against you. Has the State Department implemented any new policies, guidelines, or uh, let's see, departmental guidelines to protect Foreign Service officers' rights in situations such as the one that occurred to you? Hmm. Um, I'm un unaware of uh, anything like that. Okay. Uh, Dr. Harlan Ullman says, what is your best guess of how the Ukraine disaster could end? Mm. You get to play Old Testament prophet. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I mean that's that, that's a tough one. Except I think in the in the long run, absolutely, the Ukrainians will prevail. Uh, and I'm hoping in the short run, uh, given uh, some of their mili military successes, and frankly the appalling appallingly poor um, performance of the Russian military, I'm hoping that um, the Ukrainians will prevail in the short term. Let me ask you a follow-up. Do you think Putin is getting real information? I mean, I I'm just not in a position to know. It, you know, from a Western point of view, the decisions that are being made are, um, are not very rational, but I also think that Putin and perhaps those around him are operating um, perhaps on, a, on different data points, um, different information, um, but also I think they have different views that bolster, uh, you know, some of the, the, the rationale for some of the actions that they're taking. Has Putin changed in the 20 plus years that you followed him? I don't think so. I just think he's revealed himself more and more, um, both in um, in the way you know what he says and um, and what he does. I mean, if you look back to when he um, first became um, president of Russia, uh, almost immediately he went after the oligarchs and made very very clear. I mean, he neutered them. They became his wallets, and that's all they were. Uh, and uh, you know, then he went after the opposition, after the uh, you know um, civil society, the free press in Russia. I mean the there was, there was a free press in Russia, and he has created the society that we see today, although even so, uh, you know, in the days and weeks after, and perhaps even now, uh, after the invasion of Ukraine, after February 24th, you saw hundreds of thousands of Russians leave yeah. um, because they were concerned um, about what was coming next in Russia, not in Ukraine. Um, and although maybe they were concerned about that as well, um, but and concerned about their own safety, safety. There's a lot of anecdotal report that they're starting to come back, that those Russians really? are starting to come back. They're running mm -hmm. out of money. Mm -hmm. uh, there's only a window of time. Their bank mm -hmm. cards aren't working abroad, but it's definitely something to watch for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Viola says, can you give us more detail on the most urgent changes you think are needed at the State Department to cope with the vast number of conflicts and political tensions all over the world? Hmm. Um, well, you know, it's kind of like picking your favorite child. <laughs> I mean, there's so many things that need to be done, but I think one of the things we need to do is uh, really look hard at public diplomacy, not only, um, uh, you know, uh, around the world, mm -hmm. um, because I think we, we, we tend to do public diplomacy in many ways the way we did it back in the day. Yeah. Um, we've grafted on, you know, some of the social media, but um, we haven't, like, sort of let people loose yeah. uh, to actually use social media in the way that it is most effective. And, um, you know, every Secretary of State over the last couple of administrations has said, you know, we, 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 we need to take risks. And sometimes they mean physical risks, sometimes, sometimes they mean something else. But actually what they mean is we, we, we are not going to take any risks. <laughs> we are going to, you know, have, have this cleared through 500 bureaucracies. And the news cycle has moved on 20 times before that tweet or whatever it was um, goes out. So I think we really need to look at public diplomacy. How, you know, how do we most um, uh, effectively uh, handle this? And frankly, the Ukrainians can teach us because they are really, really good They're at it. They're so good at it. They're <laughs> yeah. so good at it. Are you talking about the at Ukraine, the, the, the uh, funny one that all, they do? Yeah, all, all of it. I mean, I think they're really great at trolling um, well, not just the Russians, uh, sometimes Western sometimes powers. Sometimes us too. <laughs> sometimes, you know, they're so good at irony. Yeah. So do you, would you leave social media up to each embassy and it's uh, the ambassador signs off on it? Is that the way to handle it? I don't even think, you know, depending what it is, I don't think it even should go to the ambassador. I mean, I think we need to um, just have a higher tolerance for risk and, uh, you know, trust our officers. I yeah. mean, they're, they're there, they're talking to people. 
um, you know, what's the worst thing that's going to happen? Uh, you know, I, I mean... You have to apologize, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I think we really need to take a hard look at this, um, but it will be a very brave administration that, you know, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's the forces go. Um, I think the other part of public diplomacy, and we can't do this now, um, but I think we should think about how to do it, is um, do a better job of explaining to the American public what we do for them. Yeah. What, what does the State Department do? You know, the, the, um, uh, the stereotypes are terrible, you know, that we're, we're serving cookies to other diplomats or something like that, or we're the people who say no to visas. We actually do a lot of other really, really important things um, for the American public. Mm -hmm. And getting that story out there so that, um, so that people understand why it's important and so that they support the mission. Because part of the reason we are under-resourced at the State Department is that nobody really understands what we do, at least in my opinion. But you said there's an irony to it. So when diplomats are doing their job well, yeah. everything's smooth, you, there's nothing... It's the dog that didn't bark. Exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly. I, I got a great question for you. you uh, in your book, you speak very little about George Kennan and your uh, student years at Princeton. Did Kennan influence your interest in the Soviet Union and your decision to join the Foreign Service? Well, you know, it's, it's funny. He, I, I, I was at Princeton, um, and he was at the um, uh, Advanced Research um, Center, the name of which I'm forgetting, a <laughs> senior moment here. Um, and uh, so I really only met him once. I mean, he wasn't, you know, a part, he was already um, older at that time, and he wasn't really a part of campus life or, um, you know, teaching or anything like that. Um, but I did meet him once, and obviously he was a legendary figure, and I, I, I still remember literally sitting at his knees because it was a very crowded uh, little little coffee <laughs> clutch that we had there. Um, but interestingly, um, I many years later in Moscow, uh, in Kyrgyzstan, in, um, and in Ukraine, I um, met his daughter, uh, Grace Kennan mm. Warnicky, who is a very good friend of mine. And so that has been, you know, kind of an, an interesting little uh, little. That, that's very cool. Can you say a little bit more? You write a lot about your, your, your mother and your father, yeah. too. And they came from uh, very complicated immigrant situations. Did that motivate you to join the Foreign Service as well? I think it did. And I, just a word about my parents. You know, when I wrote this book, I really wanted to honor them because mm -hmm. they, like so many immigrants, they came to this country with nothing. In their case, um, they, you know, left the ravages of World War II. Mm -hmm. Um, my father, you know, communism, uh, the Nazis, uh, my mother, uh, just, <laughs> just the Nazis. <laughs> and they, um, they were just so grateful to be here. And that's, um, you know, they taught my brother and I that we were fortunate to be in America. We were fortunate to be Americans and uh, we had to give back. And so that was, um, that was a pretty important influence uh, on, on, on my life. And when I thought about that in terms of careers, I, you know, I, as one does when one is younger, you know, you take detours and go here and there. Um, I, I kept on remembering, um, you know, how much I loved foreign policy and mm -hmm. history. And that married up with um, the idea of service to, to the nation. And so that was, uh, that was uh, a really um, fortuitous uh, combination. And, you know, my, my sort of interest in uh, the former Soviet Union and Russia, Ukraine, that whole area, I think certainly comes from my background because both of my parents uh, are half Russian, so I'm half Russian as well, and it just fostered this interest in the area. Super, super. I, I hope that in this next generation of reforms in the Foreign Service that uh, you will uh, be a, a, an influential voice and try to figure out how to tell more uh, young people about the Foreign Service. I didn't find out about it until I was, um, I think, 21 years old. And mm -hmm. I interned for a retired uh, DCM. Uh -huh. That's how I heard about it. Yeah. Uh, and I wish it were more well known. It's sort of this um, prized sort of <laughs> secret, right? That there's this great career That's that right. you get to move every two to three years and learn foreign languages. Uh, and I wish it were something that uh, was, you know, taught in civics classes. Or I'm not sure what the right entry point is to into American life, but mm -hmm. uh, I think more people need to know about it. That it's, I, it's an I, option. I think you're absolutely right. You know, when you think about the, the, how well known the military is, and yeah. not just the military, um, but you know, each each of the branches of service. Um, you know, we know what the Marines are, we know yeah. what the Navy is, we know what the Army and Air Force are, um, and yeah, we we. State Department needs to up its game here. I completely agree. Absolutely. Uh, Lauren Van Meter is in our audience, and she says, uh, let's talk about corruption. She says, mm -hmm. corruption is a major theme in your book, and the Biden administration has made uh, it a centerpiece in its foreign policy. 
What should the State Department be doing on this front? Well, um, I, I think it needs to continue to be front and center. In the beginning of my career, uh, and I'm not saying that you know this is typical or it was the way it was for everybody, but um, you know, in Somalia, I encountered a lot of corruption, um, both you know the little things, you know, daily life, but also um, the the president of the country, Siad Barre, was looting the country, mm. uh, and um, you know, the State Department, uh, the embassy really turned a blind eye to that because we were so focused on the security relationship. This was during the Cold War. Mm -hmm. It was important that we have a, a strong partner there. And, but the thing is, that only works so long as the strong partner is still there. Yeah. And ultimately, um, you know, Siad Barre was um, uh, unseated because, at least in part, um, because of that really uh, devastating corruption uh, in, in, in Somalia. And so I think, I think we need to make it a, um, uh, you know, a, a, a tenant, if that's the right word, a, a part of our foreign policy, um, and figure out how in each country we can help those countries, um, and maybe they can sometimes help us with some of our challenges, um, we can help them uh, to overcome some of these issues, because at the end of the day, it also affects us. You know, we don't think it does, um, but it really does affect us uh, in terms of how the people in that country view mm -hmm. us, uh, when we are, you know, cozying up mm -hmm. to somebody who is um, tremendously corrupt. The, the difficult thing is that, um, you know, there's not a roadmap for each country. There's not a roadmap for uh, a, a clear plan for, for things. And one has to be able to see what one can accomplish in a particular place. Mm -hmm. um, because right now, I mean, imagine mm -hmm. if the American ambassador uh, went in to uh, the authorities in Beijing and said, okay, we're going <laughs> to, we're going to, uh, you know, talk about this probably wouldn't get very far. Um, and, um, and so I, I, I just think that one needs to plant the seeds. Uh, one needs to see you know, when the timing is right. And one needs to think about this in, in the long view, because um, corruption is, um, you know, can be endemic, uh, and it can be a, a way of life, um, uh, particularly in countries where, uh, where things don't work very well. Um, because you know, if, if services aren't um, aren't being provided to a population, you're going to make sure that your daughter gets medical care, right? Yeah. Whatever it takes. Yeah. And if you need, you know, water piped into your home, you're you're going to figure out a way to make that happen. And so, um, so one has to really uh, take a comprehensive look, I think, mm. um, but also be realistic uh, that you can't change it all overnight. It just doesn't happen that way. And you, you, that's another big theme in your book. You're very patient. Uh, <laughs> you're in uh, Yerevan in, in one section of the book, and, and you say, we have to be realistic. You tell your team this. Mm -hmm. I can't remember what the exact uh, ask was, but it's not going to happen right now. We have to look at what's politically feasible. It, is patience uh, one, one of the most important virtues for a successful foreign service career? Well, I think, uh, so I, I think both things are. I think patience um, is, is really important because timing uh, in life is everything including in relationships between countries and, uh, and also, you know, what happens within a country, um, but also being decisive and striking when there is that opportunity. Yeah. Um, and, you know, back in Yerevan, it didn't, I was there from 2008 to 2011, didn't look like there was a lot of uh, interest in um, reform yeah. and, you know, moving forward and so forth, um, except for, you know, sort of uh, verbally. And, um, so, you know, we had some programs and we, we tried to plant the seeds. Mm -hmm. And George Schultz talks about this, mm -hmm. um, Ronald Reagan's Secretary of State, that it's important to tend the garden, um, by which he meant, you know, the, the world, uh, that you need to, um, you know, plant the seeds, you need to fertilize mm -hmm. the beautiful roses, you need to pull out those nasty weeds. Um, if you just, you know, kind of come into the garden, <laughs> which some of us do, uh, you know, in real life, come into the garden, um, you know, once a year or once every couple of years, it's a mess. Yeah. Um, and uh, the importance of, you know, doing, doing the daily work, doing the daily relationship minding, um, doing, you know, the hard, sometimes tedious work um, so that we have those relationships when we need to call on them. And I think one of the things we're seeing now in the war, um, in Russia's uh, war against Ukraine, is that um, you know the Biden administration came in with the express goal, well, one of the express goals, of um, improving our relationship with our allies, and um, you know that was uh, happening. And uh, when uh, when the war happened, I think you can see the unity 
um, that uh, came about as a result of better relations. For sure, for sure. Let, let's talk about uh, U.S. Embassy Kiev. I know that you do not speak for the State Department, uh, but can you help us understand why uh, the U.S. Embassy is not in Kiev when many of our partners are? Uh, and if it's safe to send the Secretary of State and the Minister of Defense, why is it not safe for our diplomats to be there? Yeah. Well, I think um, that after Benghazi, um, you know, and the, the multiple investigations into Benghazi, I think uh, administrations, of both Republican and Democratic, um, learned a lesson that, um, you know, you take risks, um, you're going to be punished for it politically. Mm. Um, because, you know, our jobs um, do entail a certain amount of risk, sure. and, uh, especially if we do them well. And so... I think there is a risk aversion in this administration, which is not different from you know its its predecessors. Um, and I think that's one of the things. If we think about reform of the State Department, uh, what are we uh, willing to uh, tolerate? And I think there's actually some legislation uh, on the Hill uh, with 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 that regard. Um, but I, I think you know to your specific question about Kiev. Um, I mean, I, I hope we do go back, and I hope we go back uh, quickly. I mean, looking at the public statements, I'm wondering whether there's going to be a ha the, the, the interim step of going to Lviv and maybe then later to Kiev. But I think uh, it's important symbolically. Um, you know, I'm not advocating a 1,000 Americans, uh, you know, at the embassy in Kiev. Um, but um, I think it is important that uh, the charge go back um, and a couple of, uh, you know, key, uh, key people. Super. Uh, we have a question from Voice of America's Russian Service. This is from uh, Eugene Kamarov. He said, could you please comment on uh, Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov's recent statement about nuclear war? Um, is this the one where he said that, that um, they're not, what did he say? Uh, he, did, he didn't put the quote in. So Okay, uh, I don't want to comment that, that's on fine. a quote that I... Uh, give her a call and she'll be glad to give you a comment over the phone. Okay, uh, let's see. What about President Zelensky? Mm -hmm. So before uh, February 24th, I would not have given him a very good grade on reform. He, I would have described him as pretty mediocre. Uh, but I, I think everything changed after February 24th. What's your assessment of him? Um, well, I think, you know, uh, I, I think he was struggling, you know, sort of midway uh, through his presidency. Um, and, uh, you know, as we've been discussing, I mean, corruption and reform and uh, these issues, are, they're, they're, they're pretty tough to tackle. And he was a new and untried president. And, and his team um, also, uh, you know, doesn't come from, you know, <clears throat> knowing um, all the inner workings of how the Ukrainian government works, you know, for, the, for good or for ill. Um, so, I mean, I, I think there was a big challenge there. Uh, and then uh, February 24th happened. And he, um, you know, he was, uh, the man that, the moment uh, is, is about all I can say, where he not only showed incredible courage, um, he was able to and continues to be able to reflect the Ukrainian people, their values, um, their own courage, and bind them together, unite them through his, his, his rhetoric. I mean, sort of addressing the Ukrainian people under these circumstances every night. I mean, it's incredible. Yeah. And he's able to do it with foreign publics as well. Yeah. Um, and, you know, sometimes appealing to our better natures, you know, thinking about, you know, 9-11 and um, Pearl Harbor when he uh, addressed the American Congress, um, but also trolling us to a certain extent and shaming us into uh, doing the right thing. And somehow he, he is able to walk that, uh, walk that tightrope, tightrope in a way that, frankly, I haven't seen any, any other world leader do. Yeah, I, th I think that's right. He met the moment for sure. Uh, question for you. Uh, let's see. We got lots of good questions, and we are running out of time. I have to, I have to pick. This is the hard part. Um, so, so I, 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 I'm not afraid to say this. Uh, Katya Smogli and I wrote you a, a piece when you became ambassador, mm -hmm. and we gave you. Uh, we have too much chutzpah. I think it was ten pieces of advice that you should do. Number one, you guys on the list, were trolling me. We were trolling you. <laughs> Number one was get on Twitter, and mm -hmm. you didn't do that. No. Uh, wh wh why not? Well, did I did get on Twitter. Um, I, I had a little Twitter handle, um, al although I got a lot of help. <laughs> yeah. But you weren't, you weren't super active? No. No. Were you afraid of the risk, or, or what, 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 what was your thought process? Well, I, um, you know, when, when I arrived in, in Kyiv, I, I mean, it's hard to imagine this now, of course, given the circumstances, but um, Kyiv had been at a very, very high op tempo. And um, people were exhausted there, yeah. both Americans and Ukrainian staff. And one of the things that I tried to do was to um, uh, 
uh, you know, to try to regularize things uh, a, a, a bit. And so, you know, there was a whole social media team. You know, that was their job. Um, and so I, um, I kind of tried to, to push things down as much as I could gotcha. and to try to not make every day a five alarm fire. I mean, I didn't always succeed when I was there. And obviously now every day is <laughs> a 10 alarm fire. <laughs> for sure. For sure. One last question for you from Emil. And he says, Ambassador, thank you for your outstanding service. Mm -hmm. Do you think Ukraine will need to cede territory to Russia to end the war? If so, how much? I think that that's a, a decision for the Ukrainians to make. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think we should presume to decide. The Ukrainians are fighting. They are fighting you know, for their country, for their family, for their freedom. Frankly, they're fighting for our freedom. And so I think that they should be able to make their own decisions mm -hmm. as to what, if anything, they want to sacrifice in addition. You, last question for you. You yeah. write, uh, as you're leaving Kiev, mm -hmm. uh, you're giving a speech to, to the whole uh, embassy, mm -hmm. and you're choked up, mm -hmm. and, and you're telling everyone goodbye. And you're going to make me cry now. I'm uh, sorry. <laughs> and you say, I, I love Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And that's still true, even after yeah. all this happened. Yeah, it yeah. is still true. Thank you for your service. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't had a chance to read it, it's called Lessons from the Edge. And I couldn't stop reading it. I read it on vacation. It's fabulous. <laughs> Get on Amazon, buy a copy. Get to know Masha, get to know the Foreign Service. You're going to enjoy every single page. Thank you for joining us this morning uh, via Zoom, and thank you to our in-person audience. Thank you, Masha. Thank you.